So there's a lot of these, these measures uh, for recurrence, and you can create your own. Um, yeah, so the average, uh, the average um, line length for vertical lines is called prepping time. Right? So how long does the system get trapped in a particular state once that state has occurred only once? Um, but it's actually just uh, the, the mean vertical lines, just like the mean, where is it? The average line, the mean lines of the diagonal. Was there some relationship between laminarity and trapping time? Yeah, yeah. So it's the the laminarity is the how many points are on the vertical lines, and this is the average length of vertical lines. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Well, this is the same uh, the same story uh, as as with the categorical uh, time series. You know, if you want to know how real are these uh, are these measures, you can. Uh, you can do surrogate analysis and, and just shuffle the time series and do the computation again. Um, and then, yeah, you, if you shuffle this, you get something like this, which is like white noise, right? You can uh, you expect these uh, things to drop from. Oh, yeah, so by the way, this was the Lorentz system, right? So we are looking at a completely deterministic system. Right, that's exactly also what, uh, what RQA tells us. It's 100% uh, deterministic. Uh, but if you shuffle it, well, the percent recurrence stays the same because we're, we're looking at the same um, um, criteria for considering these distances as recurrent points. The only thing is we, we just shuffle the order at which the points arrive. And then, yeah, this it causes a huge drop in deterministic. Um, or use a surrogate. So I, I think I, I took out that slide. Let me see. Yeah, maybe I'll get back to it when we're talking about cross recurrence. Um, so those are those so, so, so actual uh, surrogate data analysis or constraint realizations of the data. They they allow you to uh, have some more uh, interesting uh, null hypotheses if you want to construct a permutation test out of these things. <clears throat> then just uh, my system was produced by random numbers. Right? You can have also my system was produced by a random process, for instance, with certain properties. Um, but um, yeah, I think I have one slide about that later. So I already showed you this this website that contains this page where you have all these different types <coughs> of software um, um, listed. And, uh, yeah, and the MATLAB toolbox is one of the things most people get uh, started with. Uh, maybe we should say something about the data considerations. Uh, it, uh, these are sorts of recommendations that differ from the author to author of what you should actually do. Uh, very often the data are rescaled, <coughs> and, uh, and, and very often to um, uh, the, the distances that you get. Right, so once you've created this recurrence uh, matrix, um, they uh, sometimes divide on the maximum distance that you find in the, in the distance matrix. So this then becomes one, and you have values varying from zero to one. Um, and this can be very helpful if you want to compare different recurrence plots generated by different people, because it depends a little bit on the variable that you're looking at. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, this can be, even with stuff like heart rate, I mean, we have done lots of, lots of these experiments, and you have, you have people who have just a base heart rate of like below 70. <laughs> and other people have, have, have like 85, and, 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 still, and, and all of them are healthy. <laughs> but if you would like to compare those, uh, those uh, recurrence plots, and that is actually, and, and, and the, the, the mean level, let's say, is not really uh, something that you're interested in. Then it does make sense to do some uh, rescaling of these, of these distances. Uh, yeah, so if you have no rescaling, you have to look a little bit here at, uh, at uh, the axis. <coughs> um, it would look something like this. Uh, if you have mean distance rescaling, you just take the mean of the distances that you found. And then, of course, if you have uh, the maximum distance rescaled, you get something that is uh, going from uh, between 0 and, and 1. And, or uh, you can 
also be, of course, uh, a negative if that's how your uh, system was set up or your variable was set up. And uh, very often, maximum distance rescaling treatment. So just create a 0 to 1 um, uh, variable out of it. OK. So here we have, this is also a little bit for your reference, because we just discussed this. Um, so it's sort of a recipe, right, for doing the recurrence quantification uh, analysis. So decide which lag to use. Uh, oh, this still has the old one. Uh, is it still called that? No, it's called, it's called est, est underscore score parameters. Sorry about that. So <laughs> in the new version, it's called est underscore parameters. Uh, this should give you um, uh, uh, two things. I think it, sh it gives you the, uh, the uh, visual information function, so you can decide which lag to use. And it will automatically choose like three. And then it will also do the false nearest neighbor analysis and give you everything in one uh, nice plot. Um, uh, and, and that's what you will use to do the, uh, to decide how many uh, embedding dimensions you use. So, the, so it does the false nearest neighbor analysis. And then the rescaling, yeah, that's actually something depends a little bit. You could also do it uh, at the beginning. Um, there are also techniques that use, um, um, oh yeah, yeah, of course, if you want to use the, the, the uh, <coughs> rescaling based on the distances, you of course have to do the reconstruction. So you, you can only do the distance rescaling after you have already uh, done the reconstruction, because otherwise you don't have any distances. <coughs> and then of course, for the RQA, you need to decide what are we calling a recurrent value, right? So um, in, in Gusnet, uh, there is a way to do this by using RP plot. But still, that didn't that change. Yeah. So if you have uh, created this distance matrix using RP, um, you can use RP plot to, uh, uh, to generate a nice graph, which will give you <coughs> also um, an indication of, uh, of what uh, uh, radius would be sensible to use or basically it tells you which, um, uh, what kind of recurrence rate you would get if you choose a specific radius. So, uh, um, I want to go to this one, yeah. So this is uh, something you should get. Um, this is now one, uh, uh, you get one of these graphs in the, in the old version, you had four. But this is the average mutual information. So this is what you get if you use S parameters. And it tells you uh, where the first minimum is, uh, where the global minimum would be. So this is just the lowest value of the mutual information. And the max lag is uh, actually um, uh, the maximum lag you can use, I think, uh, by default, if you would have 10 embedding dimensions. OK. and then. You have a uh, you get a graph uh, which is doing the false nearest neighbor analysis. So and, and whenever this thing the, these lines oh yeah so the different lines here represent what the, the value you would get if you would use different values here. And very often you can see that they just overlap and it doesn't really matter which one of those values you would choose for the for the embedding dimension. At least for deciding on uh, uh, what. Uh, uh, how many dimensions to use. And usually what you would do is, you know, when it drops below the 10% line, that would be uh, an obvious uh, place to start with uh, uh, in the reconstruction. And here in, in this case, uh, so I left out all these different uh, settings because they usually give the same uh, results. And in this case, you would probably always choose like four. Um, so in, in the current version, you just get one, uh, one of these uh, uh, graphs. So you have, uh, yeah, you have the uh, the lag and the uh, and, um, number of dimensions in one uh, picture. So, so what was size? Sorry? What was size? Yeah, the size of the radius. <coughs> yeah. The, um, the radius here is, um, size is the neighborhood size. So w what kind of, uh, uh, what is the minimum yeah, what is the minimum amount of points that you would call a neighborhood? 
in, 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 the, in the reconstruction. So this is very small, so you would already call two points a neighborhood, and if then in a higher dimension they would be out, out then they would be considered false neighbors. Right? Um, but, but here you need at least 10 points to be a neighborhood. <laughs> right? And the radius is, uh, is a way <coughs> to speed up the false nearest neighbor uh, uh, algorithm. So it decides, uh, 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 it basically is a kind of multiplier for uh, how many distance values you will look for nearest neighbors to, to decide how large your neighborhood will be. So this decides also, so if you would do like a complete search of, of all possibilities, then, uh, then the, the algorithm would take a very long time. So this is kind of sort of fixing uh, certain areas around the point, so it doesn't have to go through all the possible uh, values. Is it the NN size? Is I think so, yeah. Yeah. It could also be the other way around, but it's, it's either one of those. There are basically two parameters for the, for, that are important for the false image network. But, but you don't need to know that. <laughs> um, I thought I had a nice graph about the radius decision. Yeah. That's too bad. Okay. Um, so, some things to note. Um, if you change the parameters of your analysis, so the, the radius, very obviously, you will get a higher recurrence rate. Yeah, but but if you will if you if you choose a different number of dimensions to do the reconstruction, if you choose a different lab, it is quite possible that, that the, the values you get, so the the, the 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 actual values from recurrence analysis, that they will, will change, of course. But the, the thing is, um, they they have to change uh, in a sort of systematic fashion. So um, what we usually do is if you're not sure about which parameters you should choose, we just run the analysis for different sets of parameters. And then, uh, so suppose you are comparing groups or something like that. What you will see is the absolute value of the determinism might change, but the pattern that like one group is higher than the other, that usually does not change. Right? So again, here the, the, the absolute values you get from recurrence analysis, they are very much dependent on the parameters you choose, but as long as you change everything systematically for all the, the, the subjects that you are trying to compare, then, uh, then if there is a pattern of differences, then it should stay the same, and it doesn't really matter if you uh, choose uh, different parameter settings. So usually we end up with, uh, if we really want to do group comparisons, we end up with a uniform set of parameters for everybody that, 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 that will fit everybody. Sometimes it's not possible, but very often you can find a data set like that. Uh, and yeah, if you're unsure about it, just, just uh, use different uh, parameter settings and examine what happens. Um, so if you see all of a sudden that uh, you thought, oh, look, they're, they're different. Yes, we're there. And then for all other parameter settings that make sense to you, uh, you do not find this difference. Yeah, then I would not report it. Or at least I would report it as a, as a fluke. Um, but it's, that's actually, uh, that's pretty rare. It doesn't happen very often. So I promised an example uh, of continuous, um, uh, continuous RQA. And this, is, uh, this has actually been an inspiration for the study that I talked about on Monday, uh, in which we looked at this uh, peak in the entropy uh, with the uh, uh, antisocial uh, child diet. So you've seen, if you were there, you've seen this uh, this picture already. Um, so, but, but for the for the, the uh, for this experiment, it's not about uh, uh, patients. It's not about uh, uh, pre-treatment or post-treatment. But this is about gaining insight in problem solving. And so the idea of of this uh, experiment is that <clears throat> one way to describe um, the gaining of insight in a problem that you're working on, uh, uh, yeah, you could describe this as a phase transition, right? So, uh, 
before you know the answer or for, before you have the insight, you're struggling and, 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 and you're maybe you know, going into a state that is uh, a little bit uh, uh, destabilizing. Uh, maybe you see the answer, maybe you don't, and you're thinking about how, what, what should happen. And then once you have the insight, aha, that should be a stable state again. Usually, if it's really insight, right? Uh, that's also something that's very difficult to then uh, uh, remove again, right? So usually if you have insight in something, that that's not something you lose. It can happen if you bump your head or something like that. Um, so yeah, the, the, the goal of this experiment that I'm going to talk about was to, to assess whether uh, a lot of these properties that are associated with phase transitions can be identified in people who are yeah, going through this experience of gaining insight in uh, problem solving. <clears throat> and in the, in the article that, uh, uh, I think it was published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology General, so not, not a, a small journal, uh, they use this, uh, <coughs> um, um, yeah, these pictures to demonstrate uh, what they were talking about. So this is, the, this is the vector Lorentz system, only for different parameter settings. And, um, and what they are doing is they're, they're showing uh, basically two different stable um, um, attractors for this uh, uh, for the system. Uh, so they're not going to the to the actual chaotic butterfly attractor, but these are this is this is much more stable, and this one is also very stable. So the, this would be the pre-shift attractor and the post-shift attractor, and then they sort of describe. Um, um, all the phases that are involved in uh, moving from um, uh, one tractor to the next. <coughs> so, um, of course, they, uh, the, the goal here is, is, and that's also why they're using, of course, this uh, toy model. The goal here is, again, to, uh, to learn something about this process of getting insight by, <coughs> by doing the, uh, the, the, the reconstruction. So, by, by, by trying to get, an, get, get a tap into this process um, by looking at uh, one observable of, uh, of the system, um, and, and uh, they've chosen one that is uh, that is kind of surprising and maybe not very obvious that that could tell you anything about uh, uh, a process of gaining insight. So uh, yeah, this is just uh, actually restating, uh, of course, uh, Taken's uh, theorem. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, we should be able to tell something about the system and uh, the dynamics, <coughs> in this case of the cognitive system, by looking at some other uh, observable uh, of the system. Um, and in this case, they, uh, they used hand movements. So they are, are setting their goals pretty high. And um, they're saying, listen, if this is really true, if what Takens is telling us is really true of complex system, is, if it applies to humans, and if it is the case that we can consider this gaining of insight <coughs> as a phase transition of a complex system, then, well, why not uh, look at something like hand movements? Uh, because that's connected to the cognitive system. And uh, yeah, maybe there's something interesting in there in the dynamics. Um, as you will see, it is of the hand movements here are uh, are actually related to the process that they are trying to study. So, uh, but I'll I'll show you in a moment. Uh, uh, this is what they use then to uh, sort of uh, uh, explain what they um, what they are after. Um, so, when the system is 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 doing this here. Um, um, it is in a kind of stable state, so they are looking at the entropy here. This alpha is uh, actually the, the fractal damage. Um, so they are in a, in a, in a, uh, start out in a stable state, that's this state right here. Then the transition is, is occurring, so that's this little state. And, and what you see when, it, when it's going to trans transition, <coughs> right, you can, you can see this uh, increase in fluctuation and increase in entropy, and then there's a sort of period where, where it's a little bit uh, not stable yet, so it's, it's just these lower orbits and getting higher and higher. You have the, this peak entropy somewhere, and then <coughs> that should drop again, and you should have another um, 
kind of stable state, and this would be also be reflected by uh, a stable level of, uh, of this entropy. Uh, and, and also no change anymore in the dimensionality of the system. <coughs> I think in the original article they also have a they also have a, a, a line for uh, for determinism. But I'm not sure if that is supposed to be this line. I don't think so. This is supposed to be fractal dimension. Okay, so there's the reference. Um, oh, no, it's human perception and performance. Okay, that's also good. Uh, so what were they uh, studying? Um, gear systems. So here, I don't know if this is visible, but you have here some gears, and and this has an arrow. It does this. And the question is, what direction will that uh, gear be uh, rotating towards? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I was almost scared that the, that the Finnish people would be the only ones who would not use their fingers to solve this. <laughs> so, when I ask this question, this, this automatically happens. So people will, will start to do this force tracing, right? So if it goes like this, then the other one goes like this, and then the other one goes like this, and then the one. Actually, this is a special case where you could, could, could be jammed or something like that. But anyway, um, um, and that is a very natural response, <laughs> so, right? So to, to do this force tracing. And, um, and um, oh yeah, so what is the insight you can, can get here? It's like, um, uh, well, one of them is, wait a minute, I don't have to, I don't have to do this, but uh, but if I, if I, it's alternating, right? So it's if this is going uh, right, left, right, left, something like that. Um, so you could you could just alternate, do alternating counting, but then you can realize, wait a minute, I just have to know if there's an odd or even number, and then I also know immediately the answer. So those are the kinds of levels of, uh, of insight you can have in these types of problems. But what did they measure then? Um, yeah, you just had an infrared sensor. There were two infrared cameras. And uh, yeah, they recorded the position of the, or the movements of the fingers that people uh, were making. And then, yeah, of course, they had to have kind of some kind of criterion uh, for uh, whether people had uh, received uh, insight. And um, I, I usually, they had, so that video recordings, usually people actually say, aha. <laughs> uh, but you could also look at their uh, performance. And uh, yeah, after they reach this insight, you could do all of these problems just very quickly by just looking at it. But what does this data look like? It looks like this. So um, this is uh, yeah, what, what, what their movements were doing on, on the screen, right? So. Well, do you see uh, any insight here? So they transformed this into a uh, time series uh, which represent the angular velocity, which makes kind of sense because they're, they're making these force tracing behaviors. And uh, so this is representing, so this is collapsing these two coordinates <coughs> into a time series, uh, one dimensional time series of angular velocities. What's angular velocity? Angular velocity is the, uh, the rate at which the angle uh, changes in the direction of the movement. Yeah. So a straight line would have zero or yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so what would be the um, right, right? So they have different trials, so different different types of uh, of um, of gear system problems. At some point, people would say, "Aha!" Uh -huh, or you would, have, you, you know, you could identify at this point uh, they really, uh, they really got it. And uh, and then what they did is, um, is uh, they took that aha point. Then, of course, the prediction is that you you need a specific pattern of this entropy, and they calculated. Uh, so they did the phase space reconstruction based on these angular velocities, uh, and then did RQA analysis, and then they looked at the at the entropy of this uh, uh, that you get from the RQA analysis. So that would be a characterization of really the entropy of the deterministic structure of the uh, reconstructed uh, uh, state space. Uh, so, so 
yeah, we have the aha moment, and then we're looking back, back uh, a number of trials, and um, there has to be this particular uh, uh, pattern. So you have to have a peak at some point. It has to be initially a little bit uh, low, or at least at a different level where you where you have the peak, right? And uh, you have to have loss, and, and, and it also has to be a little bit more stable afterwards. So that was the kind of pattern they were looking for, and they used uh, they used uh, survival analysis to do this, right? So you have um, uh, the event of uh, discovering the the, uh, the insight would would have a one, right? And and all the other time points or the, all the other trials would be uh, zero, and then one indicates, yeah, I discovered. I discovered this uh, 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 this rule here, and then they just analyzed whether this pattern was present on at the previous trials. And then you can see here, yeah, well, right. If you do not have this this pattern in the right order, or, or if one of the components is actually missing, that that makes a lot of difference. Uh, but you see that the, the people who have the pattern have the highest risk here of discovering the. Uh, of discovery of the rule, and that's this green line. So this green line means we have the this is a hazard function. So they have the highest hazard of uh, actually discovering this rule, and that's like at so they here they have uh, on average a trial 15, and some of them just basically don't don't, don't ever get that. Um, so this is from the fear movements, right? So so in these movements there is this pattern where, where there's a peak in entropy. Uh, and actually it's not just that, right? It has to be the specific fingerprint of, of first being a little bit stable, then, then this peak, and then going down again. And if you have this, uh, it turns out that those people are, yeah, were, the, were the, the people who were within the time of, that the experiment lasted, uh, were, were finding these rules uh, uh, the most, the earliest. So that's pretty amazing, right? So that's that's what I when I, when I talk about embodied cognition, that's what I call embodied cognition, right? So there is information about the cognitive system actually in the movements that you're making, um, but that's not all they did, um, because <clears throat> one of the interesting uh, things, and I think we talked about it, uh, maybe it was this over dinner, or <laughs> I don't forget it. We talked a lot, um, but anyway, um, um, one of the other things that so so first of all, you know, if you're trying to test hypotheses or, or test theories, uh, of course, um, um, it is very nice if the results that you you get, but also the prediction maybe that you might have in advance, uh, would be very. Uh, how did uh, how did. Uh, that they formulated would be a damn strange coincidence if uh, if you would have found them without guidance by the theory, right? So, and in this case, you know, looking for the gaining of insight in finger movements—that's already pretty much. If you don't have the theory to guide you there, that would be a damn strange coincidence if you would accidentally find it, right? But I think they they added up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, another level of, of damn strange coincidence by doing this uh, extra condition. Because it was what the theory tells us also is if you have a system that is in this destabilized de state, um, um, if you just add some noise, so if you just shake it up a little bit, this will result in the system reorganizing into the new state uh, more quickly, into a new stable state more quickly. So. Um, uh, at least in my, my microwave at home has this warning sign that if you if you're warming uh, water, for instance for tea or something, you should put in a spoon or something like that. Um, because if you don't do that, and if you make if you if you heat the water very slowly, it might actually already be almost in a boiling state, but you cannot see it. It, it's, it looks like it's just plain water, maybe a little bit, bit hot, but. But if you then touch it, it might all of a sudden uh, start to boil and then spill over the glass and stuff like that. So many microwaves have this warning that you should put in a plastic spoon or something like that. And the effect of this is that this will cause some noise uh, and, uh, and will always uh, make sure that, uh, that the water will be boiling uh, uh, or at least uh, 
uh, reflect uh, its internal state. Um, so here, this, they, they thought, what could we do here? So, okay, we know that some of these people who are solving these problems are, are, in, are at least going through this, this state of destabilization. And what could be noise here? So what they did is just, uh, when people are working on these problems, they had uh, problems shift in a random direction at a random point in time. <laughs> And then the severity of the shift and uh, the frequency with which it occurred, I think, uh, that was uh, what was the thing, things they were manipulating. So they didn't make the assignments more difficult or something like that. Well, maybe it becomes a little bit more difficult, but the, the actual assignments were, were the same, uh, but um, of the same difficulty. Uh, it's just that sometimes they would, would shift. So you would be tracing this, and then all of a sudden, oh, look. And then, and then it would, uh, go to a different place. And then the, the damn strange coincidence uh, hypothesis would be uh, this should result in people finding the, uh, the rule or the insight at an earlier point in time. So the, more, the, the, the conditions in which we have more noise uh, should actually uh, improve or, or um, uh, yeah, imp imp improve the, the, the discovery time of these rules. And these are the results. That's indeed what they found, right? So the high window shift, the highest disturbance in, in this, um, those were the people who uh, indeed um, uh, discovered the rule much earlier. And then uh, no window shift uh, is, is, is there in an intermediate. So, yeah, that's um, uh, that was a very uh, uh, impressive example when uh, when we first discovered this, and uh, and uh, yeah, we've used it a lot uh, to to develop other types of uh, not concerning uh, the game of insight, but uh, but it does show you uh, the potential of of using these things as long as you are willing to yeah to uh, accept the fact that. Uh, that uh, we're, we're just one complex system in which uh, many things are interacting. Be confused. Um, one of the things you can do is, of course, calculate these recurrence measures also in a window. So if your time series is long enough, you can just have a particular window, particular window size, and then use a kind of sliding window across the time series. Um, oh, <laughs> it flies backwards. Um, to, uh, uh, yeah, to get a kind of time series of recurrence measures, right? So you can have, well, this is just an example of different things. So window size 100 and then step size 1 and then you slide it and you have, have a time series of how the recurrence rate is changing over time, right? And this would be window of 500 and window of 1000. So does of course affects like with all window analyses uh, what you get. This is a window of 100 with step 10, step 100, step 500. So yeah, uh, all, all the uh, all the cautionary warnings for any type of window analysis uh, uh, apply, of course. But um, this might be very uh, very interesting and helpful, of course, also for detecting. Uh, transitions and I just was talking about all the cautionary notes regarding windows and us. Well that the decision for how long your window is and the step size you take uh, they always affect the outcome. <laughs> right so so yeah if you if you if you would do something like this uh, this is the result of choosing a window that's too large. Wow. And maybe here it's also too large, right? So that's always and then uh, taking a step of 1 or 10 for a window size of 100 doesn't appear to be well, a huge difference. But then, of course, yeah, if the step size increases, then it's... Then it's so, it's, yeah, for window analysis, it's always the case that uh, you also should probably check a range of windows, a range of step sizes, um, to be uh, a little bit more sure about uh, the results that you get and how much they are affected. So we've looked at the logistic map, right? So we've seen that if you change this R parameter, you will yeah, change the behavior of the system. It can become like a fixed point or a limit cycle of different periods. And it can go into chaos and out of it again. 
So if you, uh, by the way, this is, if you want to know anything about recurrent plots, <laughs> you should look up this paper, and uh, it's like uh, yeah, the ultimate reference for, for anything about recurrence analysis. Um, but it's 100 pages long, and it's in a physics journal. <laughs> Um, but it's very thorough. So uh, it, here it, ha they it has a nice table with all the recurrence measures like laminarity and yeah. determinism and those kinds of things, and it's quite easily understandable. Yeah. I like that table. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> the rest of the paper it's kind of the high level. Yeah, sometimes they lose you a bit, but, but there are very very lucid points in there. <laughs> um, but this is just to show you. So so they use the, they use this uh, also this. Uh, so, so these are all time series that are then analyzed. Uh, or they generate time series based on the logistic map for these parameter settings, and then they calculate the uh, uh, some of these uh, recurrence measures. So the divergence, like a, the, that's one of the measures that comes out, right? That should be an indication of uh, the chaoticity of the system, and you can see that 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 here somewhere here the the system drops out of the chaotic regime, and you can see the diversions also, also dropping. And it increases as, as, uh, with, the, uh, uh, yeah, with the intensity of the chaos. And then, yeah, you have, can have different combination of these parameters that indicate different types of, uh, of order transitions. Uh, yeah, we already discussed this a little bit. Not always clear what they mean by this, but yeah, if you go from one parameter setting to another, and in both parameter settings, you, you generate a, chaotic uh, time series, that's what's called a chaos-chaos transition. So you're going from chaos into more chaos, right? But RQA is, in fact, able to, to distinguish between those different uh, orders of behavior, even though it's both chaotic. So there are all, also many different uh, types of uh, recurrence plot, and usually what they manipulate is the, the how to decide what is recurring. And sometimes these can be like, uh, yeah, like, like a lot higher level of abstraction. For instance, order recurrence plots will not look at um, whether values are recurring, but whether particular sequences of values have the same uh, rank order. <laughs> so you take a small window. And then, um, no, I should say differently, the, the, the dimensionality, so the surrogate dimensions you create, we're going to analyze if those coordinates have a specific order and whether it represents this or this or this or this or this. And this is a kind of filter for, um, um, yeah, if you have very densely sampled uh, data, like, for instance, uh, EEG data. Um, and they told me that they had a really hard time to publish this in any um, uh, journal about EEG data. Because what they are claiming here is that based on their RQA, uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, in an ERP setting, I don't know if you know about ERP, but uh, that's, that's like this paradigm for neuroscientists where you uh, present lots of stimuli and then there has to be this typical brain response with like a positive peak and a negative and an N300 and those kinds of things. But, but the way they, to get that is, is that they, they, they test a lot of stimuli and then they, they average this response and then you get this nice average curve, right? And of course from the complexity perspective that's like, what, what are you doing? I mean, why do you average this? Uh, and so the, the goal here was to use these order recurrence, uh, order pattern recurrence uh, analyses to show that you actually don't need hundreds of uh, things to detect a transition because these positive and negative uh, responses that those are those are just transitions in the response of the, of, um, of the neurons and uh, and here they have some examples where they just show you, you that uh, well you could do with ten or you could do with five and actually they they claim well maybe one is even enough. Uh, the downside was that they did not find, the, in, in all the paradigms, they did not find the, the characteristic uh, 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 peaks and, and, and waves that, also not with many, many stimulus repetitions, uh, that uh, whole theories were built on. So they, they got some 
backlash of that. But these these two uh, papers uh, uh, they managed to publish. Um, yeah. So another another application in neuroscience. This is a comparison of uh, how well RQA does uh, relative to other uh, famous, uh, well-known uh, fMRI data analyses. Uh, and uh, it turns out uh, also again here that. RQA is much better at distinguishing between different types of, uh, of points that are in, uh, in these data. Um, but then again, yeah, I mean, this is then one paper in NeuroImage, which is of course a very good journal, but uh, it's not picked up by, by neuroscience. And then also there's this uh, sort of extension, which also basically uh, they felt they needed to add because of interactions with social scientists and statisticians, which is, um, yeah, you can think about uh, the recurrence matrix after you've created these recurrence plots. Of course, I've talked about shuffling the data of the time series that you use, but you could also just just uh, think about this matrix and, uh, for instance, the line segments or the distribution of line segments, at least these diagonals. As something you can also sample from in a, in a kind of bootstrap way. So there, there are several bootstrapping techniques that will give you uh, a confidence interval around all the recurrence measures. So you can have a confidence interval around determinism, recurrence rate, all those kinds of things. But it works by bootstrapping. And uh, where are these in Casper? They aren't. <laughs> when are these in Casper? Yeah, I think it's, personally, I think it's actually better to. Uh, Use the surrogate analysis, uh, but you know, if uh, someone gives me time to take take off for a month <laughs> and money, <laughs> I might might introduce it. Um, no, but it's uh, but it is available in, in the Matlab version of 